Alpha One, Alpha One, this is space, over. On an average day in Afghanistan, somebody will know where some Al-Qaeda are. Helicopters will crash into your compound. He's gonna end up being flown out of here to another location in country. At that location, they have professional interrogation teams. I'm happy with my decision to become a doctor. It's personally much more rewarding to put people back together again than blow them up. I'm bringing the dog down here right now. Yeah. Yeah, boy. That is now the property of Governor Tanawal. At night, our box gets a lot smaller, and our margin for error gets even smaller. On average day in Afghanistan, somebody will know where some Al Qaeda are. The helicopters will crash into your compound. You know, you kind of learn to learn to expect the unexpected. That's east, apparently due east of the camp, 15 meters off the road. They found rockets of some sort pointing this direction, being prepped to be fired at us. Have you got a way of talking to us? No, I don't. That's what I was going to say. All right. Yeah. Team UHF. All right. Team UHF ground. Alpha One, Alpha One, this is space. Over. My name's Luke. And I'm a staff sergeant. Could be something. This is new. Now they can take these rockets and they can lay them on the ground, put them on a little mound of dirt, get it just about maybe, maybe we can hit them, and then they'll launch them. There they are. It's right up there in that open field. That's a pretty ballsy move. Somebody driving by in the night just, just stopped off either late night, early morning pulled the rockets out, two to three guys, and went and set them up. Basically, a delayed uh, rocket attack. We had uh, dead cord with a wad of C4 shoved in the end of, of the missile. Next to the dead cord are these time pencils, and obviously, these have been fired. I can't tell you exactly what they did wrong. Just by them being stupid, the rockets didn't go off. And there's a safety pin on top. This is a pretty good little explosive explosion. It would, I'd probably be dead. You'd probably be mangled. To me, it looks like this was a rush job. If they had taken uh, a bit more time, these things would have would have fired. But as it as it was, uh, they they really uh, didn't know what they were doing. You can look at the various the, the disarray at, at the at the launch site here. I think something scared them off. This is probably uh, some some ex Taliban or some. Uh, some Al-Qaeda sympathizers. Something like that hits our little uh, pile of ammunition up there. We're going to have a, we're going to have a, a early Fourth of July. Nothing but a crater left. Yeah. Let me get our pool. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> we'd, we'd get a uh, Olympic-sized pool, in fact. I don't see any evidence of an anti-handling device or something like that. I don't, I don't see any. Hey, look, it's a booby looking for a booby trap. We're going to take some 550 cord wrap it around each projectile. I'm gonna get down in the wadi over here and I'm gonna pull it from there. So as it rolls off, if there's a firing device under here, uh, it'll fire and uh, we'll, we'll be sitting, we'll, we'll get a little concussion, but we're not gonna get, uh, we're not gonna be killed. There we go. Now this is ready. You wrapping this like this? Yeah, it'll so I ain't pulling it, you're stepping on it. Alpha, Alpha, this is Charlie 3. We're getting ready to roll these uh, rockets. Remember what happened last time when we blew the 500 pound bomb? You want a duck. All right, go on, hunt. Hey, get him. There we go. It's rolled. Yeah, it, it rolled enough to detonate it. Next one's set. Hey, Mike. Huh? 
Watch out for that landmine behind you. Okay. Yeah, thanks, man. Get out! Hold on, hold on. Tighten it up, slacks out. Rounds rolling. Clear. I say if we catch them, we should plant them squarely in their crack of their ass and <laughs> set them off. <laughs> we'll take them back, put them with the rest of our stockpile of uh, used Soviet explosives, and eventually destroy them along with everything else. After they found the, the rockets from last night, uh, the, the guys got out, they did a sweep of the perimeter all the way around the base camp. One of the Bravo Company commander guys, they found the rockets, so we're gonna go see what they got. We don't defuse them, we don't, we don't mess with them, we just blow them in place. On average day in Afghanistan, somebody's gonna get shot, rockets will show up, we'll find a mine somewhere. You name it, it'll happen. It's crazy. Let's see if it goes. I bet it goes. Burning. Don't tell Pappy on me either. <laughs> what do you got? 14 minutes? Yeah, about 14 minutes. All right. Hanging out up here is probably not the place to be. Okay. Whoa! Whoa! straight down the top. Yeah, we're going to see if the rocket they were going to launch at us was actually would have been effective and efficient by launching it just downrange at nothing in particular. Stand by. Three, two, one. Five. Watch it go. Oh. <laughs> what was the time on that? 13 minutes even. Oh, if the rockets had launched and they actually hit in the camp, the damage it could have done could have been pretty bad. But thank God uh, the Taliban and Al Qaeda are a bunch of meat sticks that really don't know what the what they're doing. So we obviously moved our security posture up significantly after the rockets, and the next day we get word, same kind of thing. Holy cow! There's mines being put in downtown. We're going to go down and take a look at uh, where the mine was placed under the music shop. Let's see if I can find the firing device, if it's laying nearby. Or just kind of see what, what they were trying to set up. See what additional information we can uh, dig up. Something related to Al-Qaeda activity or, or the Taliban. Ask him if anybody has uh, recently threatened the music shop, to his business. Since he's opened up, has anybody uh, made any threats against him or his shop? The big thing during the Taliban times was all music was banned. The music shops are new. There's just a couple of them in town. And uh, I think that that's why they, that particular shop was chosen, because it is a music shop. There's even U.S. tapes in there now. No? Let's go around back and take a look. Is it here? Yeah, that's it. He put an anti-tank mine. It takes like 500 pounds of pressure to go off. He had no way of detonating it. It wasn't command detonated, so it takes somebody going across with 500 pounds, so I don't know what he was trying to accomplish. Stupid criminals, sort of a synonymous, you know, phrase. You know, the police, they immediately came up and told us, hey, we've caught this guy doing this. So we went down there, and I mean, when you're caught placing an anti-take mine, it's pretty much you're caught red-handed. So we brought him up here and uh, started talking to him and trying, you know, piece together what was going on. What were you doing yesterday? And the whole man, he turned, you know, shades of pink. We just found rockets planted at the camp. Now we got a, an anti-tank mine getting planted in a record store in town. And this is the guy that, you know, they caught him red-handed. This is the guy doing it. Starts using the standard line, oh, I'm a religious student studying at the madrasa. Well, that's just like saying, oh, I'm an al-Qaeda operative. I guess there's no IQ test to get in. Being caught red-handed or mine-handed, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty much open and closed case. The guy's definitely a bad guy. The guy is almost a uh, textbook example of what we're looking for as far as uh, the Al-Qaeda operatives in this area. He's gonna end up being flown out of here to another location in country. At that location, they have professional interrogation teams. And by professional interrogation teams, I'm not talking about guys that, you know, like in the movies, that beat them up and shove them around and that kind of stuff. Uh, these guys are 
uh, trained professionals at what they do. They will question, re-question, use his own answers against him. They'll eventually figure out who, exactly who this guy is, what he was doing here, who he works for. When you finally go ahead and grab one, yeah, it's a good feeling. It's, it's uh, okay, you know, one more off the street, one more out of the country. It's, uh, it's definitely, uh, definitely a rush. I'm Major Gerard Curran. I'm a medical doctor, and I'm currently assigned to uh, Bagram Airfield. I've been here for five months. We're supporting a group of 1,500 to 3,000 soldiers that are conducting combat operations, and I need to be here in order to be able to provide for care if they're shot and wounded by our enemies. We had been brought by a C-130 aircraft that arrived in the middle of the night. The aircraft descended rapidly because of their concern for the ground fire from the uh, area not being totally taken and controlled. Upon touching down, the back of the C-130 opened and jettisoned our equipment. We came to a roll at the end of the taxiway. We were ordered to quickly get out. We were warned to stay on the tarmac because of the mine threat. The C-130 taxiing immediately sp spun around and took off over the equipment they'd left at the other end of the, uh, the runway. And I was worried that uh, we were surrounded by a lot of Al-Qaeda. There was a dead silence after the rush of the aircraft, and I felt extremely alone. Spanish Hospital, this is ER1, over. Roger, have you left? This is the John Kadam village, and we'll go into the clinic. That's run with the Spanish. It's a humanitarian aid mission, and we see probably about 100 to 120 patients each time. We do it about five days a week. When I initially came here, one of my key responsibilities was helping the local Northern Alliance soldiers, the Tajiks. And through that, they started bringing their children to us and their older relatives and feigning their wives' illnesses because they didn't feel comfortable coming to us. And as a result, we became fully aware of how desperately they needed increased medical care. I decided to join the Army in approximately 1981-82, as with the country was going through the problems with the hostage crisis. It took me 10 years to basically become a doctor, become board certified in emergency medicine, and I just really love my job. To Jersey. Salam. The compound that we go into is actually the personal residence of the local Afghan commander, General Babajan, who donated the use of this house, which by local standards is a relative mansion. Salam, salam, salam. I think she's going to be fine. One. I'm writing the names and the ages so that I could give it to the Spanish. They like to keep records. Nasal congestion? Ah. Glutendark? Ah, Glutendark. Glutendark. These children that I see here remind me of my son, Brenton, and remind me of how much I miss Brenton. My first son is um, Brendan Michael Curran, and Brendan is two and a half years old. My second son, Luke, was born in route to the hospital as my wife was in labor. She delivered at the roadside and was assisted by one of my friends, a fellow emergency physician who was coming out of Hardee's. And he stopped in, in the tr noon traffic jam that was occurring as a result of checkpoints on Fort Bragg. And Laura gave birth in the back of an SUV. Here's the birth announcement for Luke. Luke Gerard Curran was born the 17th of November. Uh, time, 12.30 p.m., 7 pounds, 13 ounces. 
It tears at me to be over here and not having seen Luke and realizing that this is a dangerous situation. I look forward to going home and seeing him. I don't want to miss that. I don't want to have anything bad happen. Let me see. I had a good teacher that once told me something at one of the v VAs and how important it is to just be yourself as a physician. If I see a woman who's feeling extremely lonely and sad about the fact that she's lost her husband and she's raising a child alone, it's only natural for me to think of my own wife and the problems of our separation. My best seat. It uh, consoles her a little bit. I'll show her a little bit about my own life. This little boy is the same age as my son Luke. And so I was just telling her that um, I got a little boy at home and I haven't seen him yet. And there's my mom. There's the mommy. That's more that I show last time. Oops. We might see 100 patients in a day. And um, this is only possible if you at least know some of the rudimentary phrases of medicine. Salam. Salam is hello. Uh, to Churisi. To Churisi is um, how are you? Dart. Dart is pain. Uh, tau. Tau is fever. Eshal. Eshal is diarrhea. Very good. Hoop. Hoop. Hoop, hoop means good. Seven months. So I picked up on a couple of the phrases so I could more rapidly see my patients. As an emergency medicine doctor, I'm always aware of quickly seeing the patients, especially when I have a full waiting room. <laughs> and we have a full waiting room. It's the whole country. <laughs> so... I have to go back. But Tashiko... Salam. Tachurisi. Have you treated any of these kids? I think I've treated all of them. <laughs> I think they all know. What is my name? Numachis. Numachis. Do you know my name? Numachis. Jawi. Jawi. See. Bali. Bali. Yeah. Jawi. Yeah. Yeah. See. Bali. Yeah. Bali. I'm happy with my decision to become a doctor. It's personally much more rewarding to put people back together again than blow them up. This is school. Hoop, hoop, very good. Hoop, you work hard. Don't become a soldier, nay, soldier. <laughs> become an engineer. Your country needs to be rebuilt. <laughs> I'm proud to be an American soldier doing this. I think that it's a visible sign to the people that the United States is not like the Soviets. We've come as their friends, and we're here to help, along with defeating our enemies. to get trucks, I'd let Sis know to make a, uh, a list. Uh, my name is Peter Sarvis from uh, Middletown, New York. Uh, I'm a petroleum supply specialist. Bringing fuel trucks in and, and fueling up aircraft is not very glamorous, but fuel runs this whole place, so it's probably one of the more important jobs here. I tell you, it looks like we're gonna get real busy real quick. Where we're headed, there's two gates. There's the uh, MP gate. On the outside of that, about a mile down, is the uh, Northern Alliance gate. That's where we get our fuel from, the Afghan tankers and the Pakistani tankers. This is a daily thing for us, coming out, getting fuel trucks, 10 to 15 trucks a day, bringing them in, checking the paperwork, testing the fuel, making sure it's good quality. They have to be escorted and watched pretty much every step of the way. It gets pretty hectic, pretty interesting sometimes. While they're en route, a lot of people try and take the fuel from them. We gotta make sure that when we bring the trucks in, nobody's messing with them. Hey, Sorn. Nah, Sorn, hey. They want the third one up here. Third one? You, want it? you know, the fuel's important. Everything in the military runs on the fuel. They got us going up through here now, so. What we do now is we bring them up to the MP gate and they get checked out. This right here on our left is the, uh, the MP gate. 
They bring out the dog to sniff for any bombs, run some mirrors under the truck, check for things, check the guy's paperwork, make sure it's straight, make sure that the people we're bringing in aren't uh, Al-Qaeda or Taliban. I didn't tell him to fit in. I told him to get to the end of the line. They need to wait. And if they can't be, they can turn their trucks around right now and leave. It's got to be hard enough working our gates out in the States, but when you can't talk to the people, they don't understand. You're doing a good job out here, Sergeant, for what it's worth. <laughs> Tell him right now he needs to move this truck before I throw him out of that truck and move him myself. You need to back this truck up. You need to get out. I'm bringing the dog down here right now. You tell these to stay on the They're all gonna get out of here. The dog is in route. Most of the Afghan workers here are afraid of the uh, the bomb sniffing dog. I'm afraid of the dog. <laughs> Come on. Myself, I carry my M16, and I like bringing one of the other guys in the squad. I mean, as you can see, looking around, there's mountains all around us. You never know where they could be coming in from, and you never know who the people are out here. Today, we had to bandits, so-called bandits, or soldiers, and so-called soldiers, uh, hijacked the uh, fuel trucks that were coming here. They were captured by the, uh, the local military units, and uh, we got two of the, the two of them delivered here. We spoke with them. We've identified the house where the other three are. It's the house of a former Al-Qaeda commander, an Arab, uh, by the name of Abdullah, and uh, these other three who uh, were involved in hijacking are supposed to be there and have their weapons there, and uh, we want to go try and roll them up. I'm a Major Randy. I have four children, ranging between the ages of 20 and uh, 13. And uh, uh, it's hard being away from them. You know, I've, I've learned over the years that time will go by. This too shall pass. To find myself here is uh, sort of a unique experience. My grandfather was from Afghanistan. I was always impressed with his pride in being from Afghanistan. That's our truck. Got it. Pull up on it. Yeah. Right here. Good. Salam alaikum. This is the truck for the, with the bandits we're using. Broken headlights, the flag. Hey, no, no, no. No, right here. Grab him. Grab him. Don't let him move. Step over again. Take him over to the car. Stand still and shut up. Take him over there and tell him to shut up till we talk to him. Get over there. Right there. Right there. And sit down and shut up. Tell the three guys to sit right here and not move till we get back. He says they're not the ones. But we'll come back. They're to stay there until we get back. All right, we're moving. What part of over there don't you understand? I don't care. Right now, I'm the owner. Let him check. It was the first house, but they can jump from one or the other over Right, here. and that's why I want to watch the whole block. I want to start right here. Right here, and nobody comes out. Yep. 
I'm a police assistant chief in a, a metropolitan police agency of the United States. So I was a member and then commander of a SWAT team for years. I also worked street narcotics and uh, undercover narcotics. Going left. The training and the skills and the mindset have all crossed back and forth many times. Mm -hmm. Clear. Keep going straight. Whether it's police officers in a special Clear. unit or it's here, the same concepts of leading troops in combat apply. Clear. Got a weapon? Okay. What else? You got a hole up here? Yeah. yeah. Got Army uniform. Covenant guys. You got white belts. Got more weapons. Got some AK. Come on, look up here. Yeah, you're going to need to send someone up there. I've been in uh, Special Forces. I was 10 years and enlisted. I've given 21 years to it. I'll probably give a few more years. Don't know how many because it, it really is a bit of a younger man's game. That white pickup truck. Ask him if he knows who's driving that truck. Uh, the guy in the white truck, is that the commander of these hijackers? Ask him what he knows about them. Who told him to go get the vehicle? What's his name? Masood. Masood. Where is he, Masood, now? He's horse, or here he is sitting. Sitting by the white truck. I want to talk to Masood. Okay. The vast majority of the uh, Afghan people have seen us. They've seen what we want to accomplish, and they want us here, and they want those things accomplished. In fact, they want us to do too much. They want us to solve their problems for them, their internal problems. We can't do that. Uh, they have to do that themselves, but maybe we can help shape them into how to accomplish that. Since uh, the soldiers who hijacked my tanker trucks came from there, yeah. I'm evicting all the soldiers out of there. This is now a government building. That is now the property of Governor Tanawal. You have him tell KK that the other three soldiers who hijacked my trucks that were living in there and that left this afternoon, I want them delivered to the airfield by noon tomorrow. You make sure they're there. Okay. He said we will support yeah, you. And he will talk yes. to KK and tell yes. KK for yeah. me. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Let's start rolling it up. Back to Chapman. Early on when I first came here, a number of people had commented, you look uh, Afghan, and they would be very surprised uh, when I'd say, well, I, I am. <laughs> I think it has served a purpose. It has is, it is maybe just softened a bit of the foreign presence. <laughs> <laughs> I take a bit of pride in uh, having an Afghan heritage and coming here and helping free this country from uh, the oppression that it was under, and uh, I'm hoping that America will, uh, will not leave here until we have uh, made a success of it. Profiles from the front line will continue in a moment here on ABC.
My name is Brian Collins Sinclair. I'm a lieutenant in the United States Navy, and I fly the S3 Viking. I've been flying now for four years, and it's good to finally be part of something a lot bigger than I am. Okay. And uh, they'll come in at 14,000. Environmentals should be pretty clear out there. It'll probably be pretty dark tonight, too, so if I uh, holler vertigo or cry on or anything, just back me up in the gauge. It shouldn't be a real big deal. Which controls decisions. If you guys have any questions, feel I'm doing something stupid, we'll uh, get out of the problem, solve the problem, and then get back into the game. That's awesome. Hey, I'm a Nugget. Nugget's considered a guy who's on their first cruise. I've done this now at least uh, 160 times, and no pass is ever the same. There's always something new out there for me. It's quite a challenge, I'll say, every time. We're going to fly a direction today to uh, fly over Pakistan. And from there, we'll meet up with a section of two, two Hornets. They'll join on us. We'll transfer some fuel to them, airborne. And then they'll press on their mission, and we'll come back to the carriage. Good to go. All right, there we go. There we go. I'd say the favorite part is actually the, uh, the cat shot getting shot off the front. It's just nice to get away from the boat and get away from things. No paperwork up there. You don't have to worry about time schedules. You just take off and pretty much get the freedom. Got about 10,000 pounds of gas at least and just go rage around and have a good time. the tankers overhead. We've got the extra gas for the pointy nose guys, the uh, F-18s and the F-14s. So it keeps them safe. They don't have to worry about diverting to a foreign airfield. So we're definitely a part of the team. We're clean. We're looking at this flap. Do you watch my airspeed for me? Yeah, you got two circle with them? Yeah, talk airspeed now. Okay, 220. The uh, refueling process actually takes a little bit of practice to be able to fly. But uh, basically what you have is a store attached to the left side of the S3. And it drops out on a 33-foot hose, and the receiver plane has a probe, and you're trying to get your probe directly into the basket. The tolerance on that is probably about three inches. OK, got it back there. Yep. The probe, once it feels itself being pushed forward, actually has a latching mechanism to latch on to the pilot's or the receiver aircraft probe, and then transfers the fuel. OK, first guy's done. OK. Go to the next guy. And then he'll back right out. The probe senses that it's being backed out of, believe it or not. The pressure seal releases, and the uh, receiver is clear to go on this mission. I'm just going to peel off. 702, proceed on secondary mission. From there, we're going to go out and rake some ships out in the area, see what's out there. For us, it's actually pretty standard now, just uh, flying down low getting pictures of the different tankers and various civilian ships that are around for our intel officers. When I'm the recovery tanker, we're hanging out overhead the boat and we're waiting for the F-18s and the F-14s. Oh, that's Every pilot has his night where he's just, just doesn't seem to work for him. If they were to miss the wires and they get a low fuel state, then they'll go ahead and join on us. We'll pass them enough gas for at least two or three more uh, approaches to land. I have to make sure I'm in the right position. So if they do miss the wires, they can look up and see the S3 there. Uh, he's checked the, just checked the night carrier landings, no matter how many you have, are a stressful evolution. We operate in a very small box uh, where we have limitations. And at night, our box gets a lot smaller. And our margin for error gets even smaller. What time for amp time, Chats? We call it Danger TV. This is where things can go wrong.
coming back on the boat at night, I would say, is definitely the scariest part. We're missing a lot of visual cues that we have during the day, so if you're only looking at about seven lights and you're supposed to land on the package stamp at night, it's, uh, it can get real hairy real quickly, so got to be on your, uh, got to be on the tip of your toes. We always leave the tanker up last. That's his uh, lot in life. Since he uh, has the extra gas for everybody else, we always bring him down last. As we go wings level and I drop the landing gear, that's when I've, I have to start fighting my body, fighting the uh, sense of vertigo. I have no depth perception. I can't see the horizon, but I know that I'm falling out of the sky. Oh, yeah. Well, you giving up? Oh, uh, 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 19 here. We're all around enemy territory. So my only options are to land on the boat or eject. You're a little high. Deck's going down, you're a little high. You're a little high. You're a little high. Do it. They train us that whenever you get vertigo, just to rely upon your instruments and forget what your body tells you. I'm almost up to 1,200 carrier arrested landings or traps, and I'm here to tell you that uh, daytime I do it for free, and nighttime you, the American taxpayer, pay me, and you don't pay me enough. It's uh, definitely a good reminder. You never get uh, lazy or complacent up there because it, it can kill you. First class Matthew Marcus Acosta. I'm a military photojournalist. We try and let the people back home know what the troops are doing. I want to show the people what the soldiers are going through here, what their life is, what they experience. I gave up a lot to become a military journalist. Work came first, relationships came second, and therefore none of them really worked out. Joining the military to do what I want to do, I have sacrificed a great relationship with a great girl. Jamie, she said she couldn't live with someone who would go away and she wouldn't know if they'd return or not. She's a very, very sweet girl and I, I'd spend my life with her if she could accept my future. I've always felt suppressed emotionally, like I couldn't get my feelings out for some reason. And it's amazing the, the amount of emotion you can capture on film and I, I'm so attracted to that. I went on patrol with the uh, 108th MPs, a routine patrol through a town, and the, the town leader asked us to come into his home. He invited us into his home to have some tea and butterscotch candies, and I thought that was great. Like, one of the first days I'm here, I'm in this guy's house. I don't even know. He doesn't know me, but two hours we spent in his house with his family and the rest of the village elders, and it was great. We just asked them things about their life, what they did. They asked us about ours, and it was nice. It was nice. I think we have a lot to learn from Afghans. After 20 years, 30 some odd years of war, and, and being barraged with diseases and droughts, and they are, they are tough people. But I hope people back home can see that through my photos because they're not just of the combat side of Afghanistan, they're of the more beautiful side, the, the kids, the villages, the, the older people. And I was drawn to that when I went on that NP patrol. The emotion on children's faces is just like, it says a lot. And maybe that's what I'm drawn to, the, the facial expressions of emotion. It's kind of funny, because today I just like realized, wow, you, you don't need a war for emotion. Um, you can, I mean, if you look for it, you can find it. And uh, I think maybe also being here makes me appreciate that. You don't have to 
just you, you can't just look for the obvious you need to find something beautiful about things at times and you can you can find beautiful things everywhere maybe I just been looking too hard or looking the wrong places but I don't think I need conflict journalism I mean it'd be great and exciting but I don't think I could just stick to that now anymore now that I've seen that there's other things out there I mean, there's, there's a happier side of life besides war